Hello, uh, <laughs> welcome to this uh, policy exchange event sponsored by RWTN Power. My name is Damien Carrington, I'm Head of Environment at The Guardian. Thanks very much to uh, Policy Exchange and the sponsors for uh, bringing us all here. Um, with the title of our session is called Low Carbon and Lower Bills, Can the Circle Be Squared? Which is um, an excellent title because it raises so many questions. Um, how do we cut carbon most economically? How do we deliver the right mix of nuclear, renewables, energy efficiency, gas? Um, can we really lower build? Um, or is it just lower than business as usual? Um, how can the government protect consumers? Uh, <coughs> process, it's an enormous process of uh, energy market reform. Um, I think we're expecting the next stage of that in November sometime. So a very appropriate moment to be talking about these things. Um, what's the right mix of sticks and carrots uh, that would go in there? How much intervention is needed to correct the market failures? How much should the market be left to be what it does? We've got a fantastic panel here um, who I will introduce. On my immediate right is uh, Stephen Gilbert, MP, who has recently become the Parliamentary Private Secretary to Ed Daly um, and inherited a lot of important appointments, he tells me. Um, <laughs> next on my right, Furthest to your left is Guy Johnson, he's the Director of Regulation at RWE Empower. Then on my left, um, Michael Pollitt, who's an economist from the University of Cambridge. And then on my furthest left, your right, is Simon Moore, who's a research fellow at Policy Exchange. Um, unfortunately, uh, because of all the inherited employment, Stephen Gilbert can't be here for all that long, but he's going to go first and we'll get a chance to ask a few questions and then we'll carry on from there. So, Stephen, anyway. Anyway, Thank you very much, and uh, it's good that we can start on time. Um, and apologies to everybody for doing, I think, what's called at uh, Lib Dem Conference, doing a Simon Hughes. Um, <laughs> uh, I often wondered, uh, when I see Simon in London with his own yellow taxi, uh, that this is obviously the culmination, that's the ultimate point, when you know you've uh, really gone too far in doing a Simon Hughes. I'd accepted a whole bunch of uh, fringe meetings uh, in my own right, and then last week when Ed asked me to become his uh, parliamentary private secretary. Uh, Duncan Haynes uh, relinquished six of his to me uh, as well, um, uh, with a small smile on his face, I have to say. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, genuine apologies, but I'm trying to keep everybody happy and therefore in the process probably actually annoying, uh, annoying everybody. Um, let's set out what the broad vision is at a macro level here. I think the department, the government, the coalition, has four key priorities in the sector. The first, which should be quite obvious, quite self-evident, is to ensure that we are able to keep the lights on. There's going to be no growth in the economy if business doesn't have a predictable and reliable energy supply in the medium and long term. It's clear that that would be a massive political risk. It's a place that we do not uh, and will not uh, allow uh, the country to end up in. We also have a challenge to make sure that we are decarbonising uh, not just our energy supply but our wider economy, that we're meeting our obligations uh, to future generations uh, for clean uh, energy, but also secure energy. And I think that's the second part of this priority, which is that we need to reduce our dependence on energy imported uh, from unstable, uh, unreliable parts of the world, uh, and therefore reduce our exposure to fluctuating prices uh, within energy markets, which we've seen uh, drive up bills uh, in, recent, in recent years. The third priority has to be to drive down costs for consumers. I think everybody would recognise that although we have some of the lowest uh, energy bills uh, within the European Union, it is still a struggle uh, for many families in the country to make ends meet. It's still a struggle when they see uh, the electric gas bill uh, coming in, and we need to do everything we can working uh, with the big six, working with new entrants to the market and working across uh, technologies uh, to ensure uh, value for money for consumers. And the fourth priority that the department has is to build on the outstanding economic growth, jobs growth, export growth, manufacturing growth that we've seen within uh, the green economy uh, over recent years. It's my view uh, that we will shortly see the green shoots of the economy um, taking on exactly those terms, that lots of the growth that we will have driving us out of the economic uh, problems that we are in will come, from, uh, will come from the green sector. And I think we've really got uh, four tools that I want to talk about as a department, uh, four key areas that we want to do work in um, to achieve those four strategic priorities. Uh, the first is providing investment. I think we all know, statement of the obvious, uh, that the sector needs about £110 billion pounds worth of investment 
uh, by 2020. Uh, that's in addition to the £90 billion pounds worth of investment that it needs in terms of modernising and renewing existing uh, infrastructure. 25%, or around 25% of the UK's energy infrastructure uh, needs replacing is significantly more than that uh, needs modernising. So the coalition government has an unenviable task of finding around £200 billion pounds worth of investment from private companies into our energy supply in order to keep uh, the, lights, uh, the lights on. Now, I'm sure we'll hear later that the thing that industry and investors want more than anything else is stability in policy. They want to work in an environment where they can consistently predict uh, what government is going to do, that there aren't going to be uh, significant changes in government policy at the last minute that deliver uncertainty uh, into that investment context when business is investing such huge amounts of money and over such a long period of time. It's important that the government provides stability in the policy Context, and I think that's why uh, the uh, energy bill that will go before um, Parliament uh, or start stages through the House of Commons uh, later this year is so important. In terms of driving down costs for consumers, trying to encourage uh, more trust in uh, the top six energy companies, I think the agenda there has to be about transparency, and the government has moved uh, with the energy companies to ensure that customers on their bills can see the best available uh, tariff. I think we need to go uh, a step further, which is to explain to customers what the breakdown of the charge on the bill is. There is a, uh, I think, uh, narrative out there that suggests that lots of the rises uh, that consumers have seen are due to the environmental obligations placed on energy companies by the government. That's actually uh, in no way the case. The bulk of the rise in prices has been to, uh, due to fluctuations uh, on international energy markets as we've seen competing demand uh, for a very limited uh, resource. And I think if we want to frame the debate about delivering uh, best value, we have to explain to consumers uh, what they're paying for and why, and encourage them uh, to be clear that the contribution they're making to cleaning up the carbon in our economy and in our country, developing new technologies which will lead us uh, to further economic growth is only part uh, of what they are uh, paying. It's a small part of what they're paying compared to uh, the fluctuations in the wholesale uh, energy uh, markets. And I perhaps would even put another thought there, um, that the energy companies shouldn't just be advising consumers on their best tariff, but the best tariff in the market. Uh, I think it's uh, clear that for a large number of consumers, people uh, will be able to get a better deal by switching tariffs within a company. Um, they may be able to get a better deal uh, switching tariffs between companies. And further transparency, I think, on that uh, is, is helpful. Uh, we also need to have competition in this industry in a way uh, that perhaps we haven't. I don't know how many energy companies it takes to make a market. Uh, six sounds good. I was at an event last night where somebody uh, put the thought to me, well, how many mobile phone companies are there? Well, actually, I could name uh, three or four. Um, but the point is that when new entrants come into the market, we know that they are able to drive down uh, price. We know that they are able uh, to improve competitiveness, keeping some of the bigger boys uh, on their feet. And it's quite interesting that 99% of energy customers in Britain today uh, get their energy uh, from the top six. So there really is scope uh, to uh, encourage new entrants. Uh, the government is doing this by cutting red tape, by making it easier for energy companies uh, to set up, by working uh, with Ofgem to provide a consistent <coughs> regulatory uh, environment. So governments not say one thing and Ofgem uh, doing uh, something else, uh, and also by encouraging collective switching schemes like the one in Cornwall, uh, which has just seen 20,000 uh, consumers get a significantly better deal uh, by their collective bargaining power. Um, but I think we should also be clear about one fundamental thing. The cheapest unit of energy is the unit you don't buy and you don't use. So with 50% of the nation's housing stock leaking uh, energy, being massively uh, inefficient, it's quite right that this government uh, is moving forward with a Green Deal to try and uh, better insulate people's homes, 
uh, better insulate businesses uh, and drive down the usage uh, of energy in terms of heating. I think it's a uh, legacy that as Liberal Democrats we should be uh, very proud of, but the coalition uh, partners too will be able to look around their communities and see uh, literally millions of homes where bills have gone down because of the Green Deal uh, that actually is surely the best way of saving money uh, for, people, for the people across the country. And what's the prize if we get all these things right, if we get the uh, so-called trilemma of keeping the lights on, cleaning up our energy supply and driving down uh, costs for consumers right? The prize actually are cheaper bills for individuals, a more competitive uh, and transparent industry, new companies coming into that industry. The prize is building on the fantastic work that's already happening in the green economy, generating uh, manufacturing jobs, positioning Britain as one of the leaders, for example, in uh, offshore uh, wind. And crucially, it's securing our own energy supply for ourselves uh, in Britain and no longer being dependent on fluctuating global demand or energy from unstable uh, and unreliable uh, parts of the world. This is a long-term uh, agenda. It's an agenda that is complex and requires uh, significant effort from both sides of the coalition over the coming uh, months uh, and years. And it's an agenda that I'm very proud to play a tiny role in driving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, as I say, it's just given the doctor, uh, unfortunately, as much time as we'd like. I mean, I'm happy if, if any members of the panel want to put a question or a point to Stephen, um, or members of the audience also. Um, I'm going to start off with one, because I'm the chair, and I'm an actor. Um, <laughs> which is, um, when, you, when you talk about cheaper bills, are you talking about cheaper bills than they are now, or just cheaper than they might be under some other scenario? Uh, I think, uh, hopefully both. I think the extent of the... Uh, progress that you can get in driving down costs will change. At the moment, I suspect we will continue to see uh, bills rise. The, the pace of that increase, though, will slow as new technologies come on stream. Once lots of the investment is in place, actually, I think we'll start to see in the medium term a real terms uh, decrease in growth. Okay. Any points? Oh, gentlemen there. Thank you. Um, Andy Mayer from BSF. Um, the principal problem that we're going to have on affordability is that it's already the case that the price of energy for consumers is one of the top issues. I think Paul's exchanged an um, opinion poll on that. Um, if the entire cost of green energy is passed on to consumers, that's only going to rise. If you take note of the business report that came out in July, if the cost of energy is spread to business, for example, it's going to make us uncompetitive. And the headline they gave us was it's going to be three times greater than the US and a third higher than Germany. Um, how are you going to resolve this paradox? But, but I think the clear uh, tension there is about the narrative and consumers uh, and individuals understanding what proportion of their bill goes to what uh, part of the obligations that are placed on the energy companies. I think if you look at most of the evidence, it suggests quite clearly that the energy increases that we've seen are due to changes on the wholesale market. It's due to the volatility of not having a secure indigenous domestic supply that consumers have been exposed to 50% uh, of bill rises over recent years. It's not due, in fact, to the obligations uh, that the government is putting uh, on bills in terms of trying to uh, insulate homes, uh, take carbon out of the economy. And that's why I think transparency and saying to customers, this is what you're paying and this is why you're paying it, is actually a key part of changing the public's view on whether, uh, whether they think um, being exposed to massive volatility externally uh, is a good thing, or whether a little bit of investment, which is indeed coming from their bills, but in the medium term, 5, 10, 15 years, uh, could deliver a stable, renewable and secure domestic uh, supply uh, of energy is a good investment worth making. Okay, I'm just um, by us being dying, but there's a couple of mentions there. I mean, one, one thing is, I think some companies do, some of the big six already do have some kind of breakdown on their bills. I don't know whether your company does, but would you see that as a good thing? Also, um, Stephen had a rather puckish suggestion there that you ought to uh, not only advise your customers of what the best deal was from your company, but on the market. Would you be happy promoting other 
Are they companies' tariffs? No, let me do the first one first. Um, <laughs> um, yes, we do. We do the breakdown. Um, I think I'm probably correct in saying that all the energy companies now do some form of radiator or light bulb or whatever it is diagram. Um, and I think that is hugely important. Um, and uh, it, uh, apart from anything else, recognises where the costs are coming from, where the growth in costs is coming, are coming from, and in turn, therefore, I think, prompts greater scrutiny on those areas which are making larger and larger parts of the bill. Um, as you all know, we are um, doing two things, I guess, which um, go towards your second question. Uh, the first is the um, programme that we all now have in order to ensure that uh, where we can, our customers are on our best tariff. Um, and the second is um, stemming from Ofgem's RMR programme, which is a massive um, simplification of the way in which we charge. Um, uh, and, and that hopefully will enable the sort of comparison, not just against our own tariffs, but against other companies' tariffs. That's good. Um, do you want to make a point, Michael? Um, well, obviously, I want to make a comment on the economics of, <laughs> of what's just been said. Of course, be careful what you wish for when you talk about transparency, because, of course, if you make uh, every bit of the bill and its components transparent, of course, what you might find is people aren't willing to pay that component, which is clearly identified as uh, being due to uh, green policies. I mean, all the, all, all the opinion polling that um, we've done at Cambridge suggests that, and, and that I think the companies have done, is people are willing to pay about £100 a year for environmental policies. And luckily, that's about what they're paying at the moment, perhaps a bit less on their electricity and gas bills. They're not willing to pay more than that, most of them. So if you make it clear that they are going to be paying more than that, you might find consumer resistance increases. Um, the other thing that you, you need to be careful about, uh, promoting other people's tariffs, of course, is just nonsense from an economic point of view. Because, of course, what will happen, and, 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 of course, Guy would love it, because the result of promoting other people's tariffs would be that every company will have one tariff, which is exactly the same, and which involves perfect collusion between the companies. And there'll be one monopoly tariff charged by everybody, and that will be completely transparent, to all the companies and help them to coordinate on it. Um, the, a lack of price transparency is not precisely what encourages competition. Um, so uh, you need to be very careful to understand the underlying economics of some of these things. Oh, well, I just see it's, it's a frankly bizarre notion that if you think on an anecdotal level, that if you go into a uh, news agent and uh, you want to buy a Mars bar and that Mars bar uh, doesn't have a price on it, um, but that in some way encourages the news agent next door that doesn't have a price on their Mars bar um, no, uh, no, not, not, to, uh, not, not to sell it. Clearly, uh, I'd argue that transparency will drive competition. Okay, discreet. Um, gentlemen, I'll speak. Uh, Smith from uh, National Energy Action. I'm just really just to comment um, about your, your answer to this chap's um, question. Um, I think it's partly about the narrative, but it's also very important that government policies are effective in helping people reduce their yes. risk around these, uh, you know, to future price rises, and the government's pinned, pinned itself to, 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 to that premise that their existing set of policies are going to be enough to mitigate the future price rises caused by government energy policy. So, just wanted to put, put that out there. Great. Okay. Thoughts, lady, right at the back. I write for a publication called Carbon Brief, and uh, we uh, sort of fact check uh, accuracy of media coverage on climate energy issues. We had to do the PCC, the, the nail, uh, three times on three figures that they put out on this issue because they just kept re-releasing the same figures and then correcting them and removing them again. And, you know, it's kind of like some kind of a you know, tennis between different numbers that Greenville is going to add, possibly £1,000 or £200 or £1,200 depending on what newspaper you're reading. And I wondered how, if you could comment on that with regard to the um, need that you talk about in terms of transparency, it does create a bit of a problem for the government if you're trying to um, trying to communicate what kind of bills are going to be added when the numbers are just being kind of played around in the media like this. You think? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's of course always the challenge when you have uh, political rivals, uh, industry rivals, uh, and others who want to distort an agenda and frame a public mood uh, to take a different view to a policy issue. 
Um, and of course, I would share your uh, enthusiasm for uh, accurate reporting uh, on evidence-based um, information. Um, I'm really pleased that there's an organisation out there that is um, uh, calling some of the uh, people uh, who might not be taking that approach to task. Um, I hope I don't get too many letters from you over the next period of time. <laughs> yeah, I should say Carbon Bridge are fantastic and uh, the PCC stuff you do is uh, great. I mean, I, I'm told by a very reliable source that uh, they've heard George Ockham quote those numbers out of the mail as a reason not to act on these things. It's more than a year ago. But, uh, so they are very influential. Um, Simon? Stephen, you spoke a bit about the importance of predictability in government policy to uh, nurturing investment. I was wondering how you square that with the, uh, the electricity market reform process, which seems to have struggled to deliver much predictability. DEC are still scrambling to try to put any indication on what prices they're going to offer to different technologies at the moment. In the future, they're going to have to make even more decisions about these things. I think, uh, I think what DEC are trying to do at the moment is uh, respond in as constructive a way and balanced a way as possible to very competing voices on this topic. And when the uh, final uh, bill starts its passage through Parliament, um, when some of the more detailed announcements on pricing come forward, I hope that what you'll see is that what, the, what might seem like um, uh, a period of confusion at the moment within DEC has actually been a period of consolidating, listening to what people are saying, uh, thinking about how you can uh, build a consensus from what are, in some cases, competing views, uh, and then delivering that longer-term stability. I mean, the process isn't over yet, uh, as I guess the point I make. And when the process is over, um, hopefully we'll have got to the place where we've got some more predictability uh, and some policy stability. All right, I think we'd better move on, because we've got to see our other speakers. I'm going to ask, ask, ask Stephen one last question. What, what's the right price of EDF on the table? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, if I knew, I wouldn't be uh, the first to tell you I'd be telling somebody else. Uh, well, I don't know. It's not a try. No. <laughs> okay, no, thanks very much. Please. Right, thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Guys, thanks you want to uh, carry on, please? Um, so, the question is about squaring the circle of low carbon and lower bills. Um, and the first thing to say is the information is out there. Um, most of the things that I'll talk about are from um, off-germs analysis. Um, but if you look now, um, say it's a typical um, direct debit electricity bill, 6% um, of that is now made up of energy efficiency program costs at the cost of certain sets. Of course, um, you know, one of the things that um, was noticeable in our um, competitors' SSE's announcement uh, last month was that those have gone up by 30% over the last 12 months, those costs. Um, you then look at the cost of the renewable obligation, they're 4% for the typical electricity bill, but the cost of the EU ETS, they're 3% for the typical electricity bill. Um, and, and I think what will increasingly be subject to scrutiny is network costs. Network costs are now 23% of the typical electricity bill. And um, Ofgem have talked about an investment on, on, in the network um, of something like £30 billion pounds over the next decade. Um, again, if you look at the SSE comment, um, those network costs have increased by 9% um, over the last 12 months. And, you know, it is, it is different when one's talking about small percentages of the bill going up by that level. One is now talking about increasingly large parts of the bill going up by that sort of level. So I think that, um, you know, that is the background. That is um, why I think, you know, there is inevitably going to be greater and greater scrutiny on something which, you know, on that maths makes up 36% now of the typical electricity bill, you know, having put in the cost of warm home discount in there, having put in the VAT cost, etc. Um, so you can see that um, the makeup of the bill is changing. And I think, therefore, it highlights two, two things, and you know, nobody's talking about the low carbon agenda not being important. Nobody is talking about the energy efficiency agenda not being important. Indeed, I think what I'm saying is that the energy efficiency agenda is more important because of, because of those things. Um, but we have to have an understanding that, as in all policy matters, there's a balance to be drawn here. 
we have to have an understanding, I think, that the crucial thing to me is that good policy in the area of decarbonisation, good policy in the area of, of um, energy efficiency, is policy that is cost effective. Because you know, we can see that 13% you know, compared to 10 years ago, um, you know, nothing. Um, renewable obligations 2002, um, certain ses successors to the original energy efficiency obligation also of, of 2002. We didn't have these things 10 years ago. Um, so um, <coughs> my um, comment, and I suppose my um, plea, would be that if we look at the hugely important things that are happening through EMR, and as we look at uh, particularly the energy company obligation as the successor to certain sets, um, those measures are thought through not just in terms of um, the decarbonisation benefit, but also in terms of the cost to bills, and, and there has to be a balance to be drawn. As I said, just uh, I'll finish because I'm conscious that um, I have a very brief period to stand in front of you and talk here. Uh, network costs, you know, this is a big number, and this is an increasing um, number. Jim, on its own analysis, suggests that. Um, not all of it, but some of it is to do with connection to the increasing uh, participation of renewables in our energy mix. <coughs> be conscious of that. We've got to be conscious of the um, location costs of transmission and of the importance of taking that into account, amongst other things, as we look at the future costs for, for, um, for consumers of energy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Guy. Um, just want to ask you a quick question. I mean, the, the, the Treasury imposed a cap on the levy that's allowed to be placed on bills. Does that not give you some reassurance <coughs> about you know, to what extent these might rise? It does. Um, as you know, the levy doesn't apply to all those costs that I've been talking about. Um, but it does give us some reassurance, yes. Um, and, you know, as I say, I, you know, I think, Damien, as, as we get increased scrutiny, you know, people are going to want to understand what these costs are triggered by, who's bearing them, who's getting the benefit of them, um, uh, you know, whether there's a cap or otherwise. Okay. Thanks very much. Next. Uh, thanks very much, Damien. Um, okay. Um, well, of course, the good news is that people don't consume... Um, units of energy, they consume uh, energy services. So the hope for lower bills um, would be based on uh, innovation in energy efficiency, uh, which we've already talked about, um, and of course the hope that uh, people's incomes don't rise that much, um, because of course that generates more demand for energy services, and the hope that fossil fuel prices um, are high, therefore bills are relatively lower because uh, of, of low carbon policy, we've already heard um, mention of that. Um, now that doesn't mean that bills are going to fall, it just means they might be lower than they would otherwise have been in the absence of uh, uh, low carbon policies. How can we keep bills from rising too much? And we've already heard some of the classic things that you should never say if you're well educated. Um, we should um, ban any uh, use of arguments about green jobs and green manufacturing because these things are expensive, they reduce GDP and they definitely raise energy costs if the costs are imposed on energy consumers. Um, we shouldn't use energy security arguments to justify mm -hmm. renewables and um, uh, nuclear energy. It only takes a casual look around the world to tell you that Countries that are reliant on renewable energy or on nuclear are exposed to much more energy security than those who participate fully in world uh, energy markets and pay the world market price for energy. Um, and uh, we shouldn't, of course, uh, confuse re renewable policy with decarbonisation. If we're interested in decarbonisation, we should not be so interested in renewables because renewables may be a very expensive way to decarbonise. And, of course, the other thing that consumers uh, end up paying for, which is a bad thing, are mass rollouts of immature technologies before they've actually been proven. So a smart meter rollout to everyone in double-quick time is, of course, a silly idea, given that meter technology is improving all the time and not everybody may need a smart meter. Similarly, offshore wind is an immature technology which is blindingly expensive <coughs> and we may be rolling it out far too early. What we need is more experimentation, technologically focused innovation, which may have the prospect be much cheaper and give much lower costs in the future. 
And then finally, what about the government's electricity market reform? Um, well, of course, as Damien's alluded to, uh, the central element of that is a contract of difference, um, feed-in tariff for low-carbon energy, a strike price for nuclear. Now, uh, EMR has a number of very bad features. Uh, one of them is, of course, completely undermines the European emissions trading system for carbon. So the, the net result of us investing in nuclear power will be to allow the Poles or whoever, or the Germans, to emit far more uh, CO2 from their coal-fired power plants within the EU ETS cap. It will not be to reduce the amount of CO2 produced in Europe. Um, and, of course, the other problem with the CFD fit um, is that, there, as David also alluded to, there's only one bidder for the first nuclear power plant. Therefore, the, the likelihood that we're going to get a competitive price for that uh, would seem to be uh, nil. Um, so, uh, what's the conclusion? Well, I, I think the conclusion is it's about time energy policy paid a lot more attention to economics um, than it and paid as much attention to economics as it does to climate change science because if it doesn't pay attention to economics, as Guy suggested, the wheels are going to fall off um, all the policy that lies around the Climate Change Act and there's no hope that we will deliver our decarbonisation targets. Just briefly, so how would you how would you view a rewriting of EMR, <coughs> taking out of economics? What, how would it look different? So I think, uh, well, the the central recommendation of an economic analysis of climate change is that you must raise the price of carbon and you must do it consistently and over as wide an area as possible. Um, okay. So the European Emissions Trading System is the only show in time at the moment. Okay. And one last brief question, because you talked about. Um, can't use the argument that green jobs and economic growth are, are sort of uh, a reason for doing these things. Um, I was just wondering, the CGI had a report you know, at the start of the summer suggesting that the green economy broadly was actually very important in driving economic growth in the country. I was wondering if they're badly educated too. Oh, I think they probably are. Um, and, you know, because of course it depends on what you count as a green job. You know, somebody, somebody work, working in the water industry is that a green job. What is definitely the case is that subsidising offshore wind in the UK in the hope of creating green jobs, that is as expensive as it was subsidising British coal in the bad old days of um, national ownership in terms of cost per job. Um, okay, thanks for that. Simon. So, okay, thanks, Damien. Uh, as is usually the case, being last to go, uh, that's a rather pit the subject, <laughs> clean, but I'll, I'll try to say something that's not too repetitive. Um, so some of you may have heard this spiel yesterday. For those of you not familiar with policy exchanges, environmental philosophy, uh, we argue that environmental challenges, most importantly climate change, need to be tackled while minimizing their impact on living standards. In other words, at least cost. The lower their costs, the more likely policies are to be politically sustainable and successfully reach long-term environmental objectives. Um, obviously this is particularly important for the highest profile environmental challenge of our time, climate change. Uh, it's important because the amounts of money we're talking about are vast, as we already heard from Stephen, uh, and politicians need to reassure the public that their money is being well spent, not only that they're getting the most impact on climate change for the money, but also that the money couldn't be better spent on the other areas of policy that government deals with. Um, as I think the gentleman in the audience mentioned already, voters already perceive energy bills as one of the areas where politicians can most readily improve uh, their quality of life. Uh, these pressures around uh, energy bills are unlikely to subside as the uh, costs of environmental policies increase over the second half of this decade. Um, it's important to focus on cost effectiveness <coughs> because climate change is a global problem and tackling it will require the participation of everybody, not just the UK or the EU. Uh, uh, a a, a, a non-cost uh, effective climate policy risks setting a very uncompelling example to those countries we want to follow our lead if we show them that uh, particular policies that we adopt lead to questionable benefits in terms of carbon or lead to huge costs on the public. They are 
less likely to be followed than more efficient ones. Uh, so what does this mean in terms of policy? Um, I think this means aiming for the cheapest possible car uh, carbon cuts, which in turn means there are serious <coughs> questions about the current energy bill and its ability to deliver those. Uh, electricity market reform, as we've already discussed to some extent, involves a lot of decisions being made by civil servants or regulators about what they think the costs of technologies might be years into the future. As we've seen throughout history, government is terrible at making these kind of decisions and the scope for bad guesses and unintended consequences is enormous. Um, for those sectors of the economy that are already covered by the EU emissions trading system, especially electricity generation, the government needs to focus on letting the cat do its job rather than hamstringing it with additional requirements that push up costs but don't actually do anything to reduce carbon, they just shuffle it around Europe. Uh, if the government must do more than the EU ETS already does, it needs to focus its attention on things that are not already covered by the cap. Uh, energy efficiency, then, is one of the big areas where both additional carbon cuts can be delivered and potentially some of the problems surrounding energy bill rises can be moderated or mitigated, especially for those houses in or near fuel poverty. Uh, it's, it, this also applies for uh, incentives for demand reduction, um, where there's a lack of clarity about how, if at all, the energy bill will, will deal with those things. Um, and just as a final point, I think Damon's already highlighted this throughout the presentation, I think it's important to be as clear as possible when we're talking with the public about the costs and benefits of climate policy. There's a big risk when talking about lower bills when the public hears bills lower than they are now, when in fact what we're talking about is bills lower than they might have been at some point in the future if we've done things differently. Uh, if you're building expectations for bills to drop and those expectations aren't met, you risk undermining greater support for, uh, for those suite of policies. Debt's own work has shown that most of the bill lowering rather than bill raising potential from its policies comes from the energy efficiency stuff, not from the renewable stuff or the generation side things. So if participation in the Green Deal, Eco, whatever else it happens to be, is the only way of getting those bill reductions, I think that needs to be expressed much more clearly than it already has been. Okay, great. Uh, we'll come to questions um, very shortly. I want to pick up one thing that uh, everybody on the panel actually is that uh, not for the first time a policy exchange events we come to carbon price um, <laughs> as being kind of a, a cure all, if you like, or at least certainly something very important. Um, I wonder, I mean, some people say that the current ECS is oversupplied, right? There's a billion, billion permits going to there thanks to recession and. Uh, and kind of industrial lobbying before that. So how do we fix it and how likely is that fix to like to happen? Do you want to start with that Simon? So it's, it's a good question, it's one that I think we're going to be looking at in quite some detail in the months to come. Okay. I, I think one thing, one, 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 thing, one, one thing that I'm going to say already is that I don't think the sort of delay set aside plan is a particularly effective one. We're talking about withholding some permits yeah. in the next year but then releasing them the sort of later stages so of the out. ETS. I think if you're going to do it by right, the need to do it properly or not at all, these people can, they know how banking works, they know how borrowing works, mm. they, can, uh, they can adjust for uh, a release of permits that's going to happen at some point in the future instead of today. So I don't think that's the most I'm useful sure way of how likely you know, getting a billion permits out of ETS is. Um, the political challenge is fairly well known. There are a handful, perhaps only one country, that are, is the obstacle to that, where they can be uh, persuaded <laughs> somehow or other. <coughs> the, the, you know, the impact on their industry can be upset in some other way. Okay. We'll see. I think, uh, Michael, most people agree that the UTS would be a good scheme if it works, but if it doesn't work, is it worth it? Um, I think the question is. Uh, what does the fact that the UETS 
it doesn't work, tell us. And I think it tells us at the moment that Europe is not serious about climate change. Okay? That is primarily what it tells us. And I think that poses a difficult question for Britain because Britain has to face up to the fact that if the rest of Europe isn't serious about climate change, it doesn't really matter whether we're serious about it or not. That's, of course, what Europe discovered at Kyoto. It doesn't matter whether Europe's serious about that, nobody else is. And, you know, you know, unless Britain can, you know, Britain's position should be we want to encourage Europe to get serious about climate change. If we can't do that, we need to reassess our own policy. Going it alone is madness if nobody else is coming with us. Okay, Kai. Well, I suppose the only thing about I think the only thing I would add to that is, you know, Britain clearly is serious about climate change, mm -hmm. and Britain has um, unilaterally shown its seriousness about climate change by Carl Brussel introduced during the budget a couple of years ago, yeah. um, and you know that is an an increasing cost to our consumer, whether it be um, domestic or whether it be industrial. So. Um, you know, it is important that there is a credible. Well, I'm sorry, I'm saying what you're saying. It is important. There's a credible European scheme here, but do remember that the uh, the UK has gone it alone. I mean, do, just in your opinion about how likely some reform of ETS is in the next five years or so? Um, you know, Damien, if I had a crystal ball, I, I I would think that there is a likelihood of that. Um, I believe that. Um, you know, there is some signs of uh, a greater focus on this um, across Europe. Um, but, I, you know, as I say, I think that, um, you know, the fact is that um, the UK is clearly serious about it. Mm -hmm. is, it I mean, is your company in favour of tightening up the caps? I mean, you pay a lot of money in there already and if the prices go up, that wouldn't be so good for you. Um, yeah, but then equally, you know, you've got to remember that we are the largest investor in installed renewables in the UK. Okay, big questions. Right at the back. Um, yeah, Alistair Harper, Green Alliance. I just wanted to uh, come back on the idea that we can't have green and economic growth. Uh, Damien referred to that CBI report that said a third of our growth last year came from a green economy, and that wasn't made up on the back of a, a, a fag packet. That came from biz data, which also shows we exported more than 300, uh, 330 million more of green goods and services to China than we imported from them, which is also a sign of that we're not doing this alone. China is investing this hugely. South Korea, you know, Australia, everyone's moving in one direction. So we're the ones who are going to risk being left behind if we don't keep pushing this. Um, but <laughs> on efficiency, I wanted to ask the panel what they thought happens after the Green Deal and how we have a government programme that goes beyond just dealing with heating efficiency and looks at all our electricity use. Right, should I start with you? I mean, you have a relationship with a very large number of customers and yeah. you've been put in the position of having to deliver some of these things in the past. Yeah. What do you think should happen beyond Green Deal? Well, I, think, I think the first thing to say is, you know, the key is heating efficiency and there's enough to go out there mm -hmm. for an awfully long time. Mm -hmm. Second thing to say is not only is the key heating efficiency, but there is still an awful lot of low hanging fruit. Um, and you know, it is important that we spend as many of the £350 that we can on capital wall insulation that will save £150, £200 per annum on the bill um, as we can. Um, loft insulation isn't quite that effective, but it's comparable. Um, and I would strongly argue that we move to the lower hanging fruit, most obvious being um, solid wall insulation, uh, we have to do some. Um, but you know, let's for goodness sake do the most economic things first, things that have a two year payback or less than two year payback first, um, before we do the £6,000 with all the difficulties both in terms of acceptability, disruption, aesthetics of solid wall insulation. Um, I actually think that um, you know, it's quite hard to be honest to look beyond the focus that we need to have on heating. I think that if anything, um, policymakers are to some extent catching up on the focus of um, the importance of, of heating and to some extent therefore the importance of, of, of gas um, in comparison to perhaps what the focus has been over the last few years. Um, and um, um, I think in, 
in my um, at least time scale in terms of energy efficiency, let's for goodness sake make Green Deal work. Let's try and make it go as efficient as possible. Um, and I think that will be challenges for many years to come. We're looking at our already looking at our March 2015 challenge under ECO, um, you know, with some um, interest. Michael's opposing view from Alistair there, we're going to get left behind, so you're saying it's madness to go it alone. Okay, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, you know, where to start with that, I mean, we need to be very, very careful about any analysis which says that, you know, ministers, I know, have become a bit more careful in what they say you now about jobs and, and, and growth. Of course, if you throw a lot of money at one particular sector, it will grow rapidly. Um, that's not the point. The point is, what's it doing to the whole economy? and whether we've got a long-term comparative advantage in offshore wind turbines or whatever it is, which we clearly don't, okay? Um, so, you know, <coughs> we don't need this large-scale, heavy engineering, which we, we haven't got comparative advantage in at the moment. Um, we've got comparative advantage in, in, in service sectors, um, so clearly, and things that focus on the demand side, and smarter use of energy, um, that's something that we may well be able to export the sort of services around that. But the idea that green manufacturing is somehow adding to the net British economy, um, you know, our, our, it's, it is just an old-fashioned industrial policy where we're backing a particular sector which is in a very competitive global market where it's not clear that we have a, a, a long-term comparative advantage. You know, the Danes and the Germans are, always, are already way ahead in, in green manufacturing for heavy duty. Uh, wind turbines, for instance, and even they, of course, are beginning to suffer Chinese competition. Um, so, you know, this this idea is fanciful that, that um, somehow, you know, we're going to benefit from this when we haven't benefited from any other sector like this. And of course, you we do have a lot of jobs in energy intensive sectors. You know, the car industry is one of the sectors where we where we're doing really well at the moment. Um, you know, so there's clearly conflicts once you start backing one sector against other sectors which may, may not do as well as a result of backing them. So when, one must look at the sort of general whole economy picture when one makes up the arguments of, the, of this type. And of course in a depressed economy, if you, if you spend money, you may be able to get a, a conventional Keynesian impact effect. That doesn't mean that it's a long-term good investment. Um, so, uh, so I, I, you know, I haven't seen any convincing analysis that we should back um, green manufacturing for, for the sake of GDP and jobs. Yeah, we'll see what I thought this did. But Simon, do you want to say anything about uh, energy efficiency? Or I, I, I don't think I have a huge amount to add to what the previous panelists have said on Alice's question, but I did want to, if I may, pick up on one of the things that Guy said in response to your last question. Uh, you used the example of the carbon floor price as an example of the UK government getting serious or being serious about climate policy. This is a policy that can reduce no carbon. It can reduce it in the UK, but allow the rest of Europe under the same constrained ETS cap to emit more. Um, isn't this, rather than being an example of the UK government being serious about climate policy, rather than an example of it being serious about symbols that don't actually accomplish very much? What do you think? <laughs> um, well, I was less cynical. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you want to ask a question? Mm. Yeah. Uh, James Corey from the Climate Parliament, which is an NGO. Um, I think by allowing ourselves to become fixated on the proportion of our energy bills that go to subsidising the renewables obligation, we're really acquiescing to that daily ma daily mail kind of agenda because the. The, the, the elephant in the room is that there are all sorts of far greater subsidies to the nuclear industry, to the fossil fuel industry that don't appear on our energy bills simply because uh, they're part of government expenditure rather than rather than being passed on to the consumer. And um, so, you know, for for example, you know, we don't see in our little light, light bulb on our energy bill uh, that the lion's share of debt budget goes into nuclear decommissioning. We don't see on our energy bill that over decades we've put huge subsidies through the EU budget into subsidising gas pipelines. Um, so 
Perhaps it's time that we simply designed uh, support for the renewables industry in a way that, that those costs aren't all passed on to the consumer via their energy bills, um, and more of them are reflected in, in direct government spending, whether it's through, uh, whether it's through uh, kind of risk, um, risk minimisation for the industry, like providing loan guarantees for, for renewable energy generation, uh, or even direct subsidies, and um, you know, to buy, yeah, I, I think I've made my point. You have. Um, <coughs> we'll have to pick that up. We'd be solving a problem if uh, the money that is getting put into renewables was came through general taxation rather than <coughs> placed on bills. Well, I mean, there's a there's a very. I mean, I agree with you. I think it would be much more honest. You know, if, if this is a policy, where um, which it, it should be clearly. Paid for out of general taxation in some in some cases. Okay, I mean clearly there's there there is a uh, a sort of environmental externality argument to make it the polluter pay in some cases. Um, but if it's industrial policy towards renewables, yes, that should come out of general taxation. But of course, the reason why it comes out of our bills is because um, the political system doesn't want it to become part of general taxation because then it would be very unlikely to be, to expand. Okay. That we, you know, we have had a set of policies for several years now, which have been hidden, and that has allowed politicians to get away with increasing the costs of them. If it was made fully transparent, I think you would find the res you know resistance to uh, taxpayers paying for it. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I was trying hopefully not to be fixated. I was simply trying to say that it is there. It wasn't there ten years ago. It is there now. It is the increasing percentage. Um, I mean, Damien's talked about the levy control framework. Uh, you know, I think that um, as it becomes an increasing percentage, whether it be Treasury, whether it be uh, the public, are going to be more and more interested in this. And I think transparency is therefore important. Let's hopefully avoid the fixation. Um, there are many of these things where um, you know, there's no doubt that you know, the concept of tax capacity, the, the concept of tax capacity, whether it be direct or indirect, is something that is completely going to occupy treasuries and other people's minds here. Hmm. Hmm. Like. Hi, uh, Sean Williams from Friends of the Earth. I uh, just want to pick up on the resistance to uh, making it part of general taxation. Our polling shows that 85% of the public are in favour of bringing forward legislation uh, to increase the percentage of en energy generated by renewables. I think it ties in with the point about Europe. Um, I think the public gets it, there's an urgency, and we need to show leadership. Um, and also, I mean, just with Simon's point about cost effectiveness, I agree the more cost effective your policies are, the more you can get out of them. Um, but I just wonder how you trade that off against the urgency that we've got at the moment. Um, I think, first, first of all, I'm somewhat sceptical of these polling results that say X percentage of people believe this technology is fantastic or one of them. Uh, all of the things being equal, renewable technologies are lovely. They don't emit any carbon. They can provide a, a, a good, steady amount of electricity. But all of the things aren't equal. Costs are not equal. Uh, the need for being balanced by other technologies are not equal. The need for um, the land use is <coughs> not equal. And so these things always have to reflect the cost of deploying technologies, not just simply whether something polls well or not. Um, in terms of the, the urgency, um, uh, I think the, the target for, that we've got for 2050 is probably an appropriate one, so long as the rest of the world is doing its bit as well. I think I agree with what Michael said earlier, however, that there is very little point in the UK getting massively ahead of the rest of the world if the rest of the world decides that this is something that it's not sufficiently bothered about to tackle properly. Then we'll drown together. We, 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 we drown together and spend money on the drown and dump. Isn't that a different point? I know that you know, Friends of the Earth and some of the other groups have been quite excited about this idea of a decarbonisation target for 2030, which. Um, Mm -hmm. Dave is back and so is uh, Ed Miliband. Um, I mean, do you guys think that that's a, uh, you talk about 2050 target being yeah. a good thing, do you think we need a 2030 decarbonisation target, 50 or 100 grams, say, per, 
Let's see a super cool end. This is just posturing, isn't it? I mean, this is this is competition between politicians in how fast you know how how fast we can decarbonise. Just as we had we've had lots of posturing about how fast we can roll the smart meters out, and of course. You know, the point is that it makes, it's not going to make a blind bit of difference to world global climate change, how fast we do it, but it is going to be blindingly expensive the faster we try and do these policies. And, and you know, the fact is we're going to, we are going to hit more and more resistance um, to, to the policy itself the, the, the more ambitious we make these targets. And for, of course, for many years, politicians have traded on the fact that Climate change was something everybody agreed we should do something about, and it wasn't that costly to implement a policy to do something about. But now we're hitting the point where it is costly to continue to ramp up the policy, and people are noticing. <coughs> Just to add to that, I, 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 I um, agree with Michael. I'm very skeptical of that, the 50 grand target per se. I think it's another one of these instances like the carbon floor price, where we're trying to, to say something that is noticeable, but which, again, it just moves emissions around Europe. It can't deliver additional emissions while the ETS exists. If we want to do more, if we want to you know, be more aggressive on these things, it should be in areas that aren't covered by the ETS cap, where additional carbon, uh, carbon cuts can actually be made. Okay. Now, just to say that I think um, our point would be that uh, the number itself shouldn't necessarily be set, but it should be in line with the advice of the Committee on Climate Change. Um, and just in terms of how expensive things are to do now, they're only probably going to get more expensive as time goes on. Um, and in terms of insulating, you know, if the low hanging fruit is insulation, there's a lot of resistance and the work the Green Alliance has done in terms of changing behaviour. It's very difficult unless you have, you know, an overarching campaign, um, probably at national level, to get people on board with that. So. I think we have to be doing everything that we can at the moment, not just kind of saying, well, this is, let's spend on the most cost effective thing and, and, and hope that works. I think, um, you know, this is about balance for me. Um, you know, we have, we have just um, opened Pembroke, which is a 2,200 megawatt gas fired power station, CCGT. And, and I think that's important for the UK. And I don't just say that for security of supply reasons. Um, you know, it, it, its emissions are certainly well less than a half of the coal-fired power stations, and pretty well the same week that we announced the opening of Pembroke, we announced the closure of Dipcot 8, which is the coal-fired power station, and Fawley, which is an oil-fired power station. Um, so, you know, there is massive benefits in decarbonisation terms, and, you know, I accept it depends on your, your goals and where you start from Pembroke itself. And of course, I think you know everybody will view Pembroke as important for the future generation mix. Now, you know there may be a lot of differences in this room as to whether it's important because it's seen as baseload, or whether it's important because it's seen as flexible backup for renewables. And of course, the great things about you know the new CCGTs, apart from their huge efficiency in comparison to the old, is the fact that we're talking about you know, two, three hours startup time. You know, they do have far greater flexibility than our old um, gas plant. Um, but, you know, whether you view them as standby or whether you view them as, as baseload, um, the fact is that, um, you know, hugely reduced though they are, we're talking about, um, you know, um, something that's some way above um, the sort of um, ultimate um, measures that, uh, that you're talking about. And I think there has to be a balance, including something like that. Okay, we're almost out of time. We're going to finish by um, asking the panelists a question, which is, um, we'll assume... It's 2020 and we've got to low carbon. Do you think bills will be lower or higher in real terms than they are now? <laughs> I'll come to Guy because he's got lots of real customers with bills. How about start with Simon? Sorry, what do you mean by we've got to low carbon? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm just assuming we hit the carbon targets, whatever you want them to be. I'm just wondering whether the bills will be lower or not in real terms. Uh, I don't know. My guess would be that they would be higher, but I don't, you know, nobody really knows the answer to it. Well, they'll almost certainly be higher than they would have been. The fact is that there are things coming through. You know, we have to talk about PD and tariffs. They're a tiny part of the bill at the moment, but mm -hmm. that, that's going to grow. Mm -hmm. So there are kind of things coming through. Um, as I tried to say at the beginning, the key to me is the effectiveness of the energy efficiency programs. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Very good. Listen, thank you very much to uh, all the panellists and to Stephen uh, earlier and Mr. Policy Exchange and uh, RWM Power. Uh, thank you. Thank you.